Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. Three weeks ago, YouTube video creator Deep Space Courier released an unofficial video depicting a possible interior layout of the Starship. That video, viewed almost half a million times already, was picked up by other YouTube channels and heralded as being a wonderful depiction of how a trip to Mars might be experienced by would-be colonists. Some viewers, such as Ryan, have started to hold this video up as proof there will be plenty of space aboard a Starship for 100 people. So we're going to check the video over with a fine tooth comb, do some basic measurements and calculations, and see if the video holds up under some scrutiny. First off, let's acknowledge the quality of the video and the animation skills of their team. First rate CGI, wonderfully rendered graphics. Some thought was actually put into the ship layout. Nice walkthrough with a bit of a storyline and humor. But the critique has to start with the opening credits and this particular depiction of the outside of Starship. These giant solar fins, they've appeared in many, many Starship animations, including right off the SpaceX site going back to the original ITS video. Yet nobody has ever explained where they are stored or how they expand. By all appearances, in that position, they would need to come from within the propellant tanks. They would also need to retract before attempting to land, so where are those compartments in this artist's concept? Further, as with the ISS, the vehicle would require a large array of radiators for cooling the interior of the ship, and those don't seem to be accounted for. In rough numbers, the ISS has about the same pressurized volume as the Starship, roughly the same as the 747 jet at 32,333 cubic feet. That space contains four to six astronauts. To keep the station cool, they use 1,680 square feet or 156 square meters of honeycombed aluminum panels that pump ammonia through them to exchange heat, and the ISS also hides from the sun half the time in the Earth's shadow, allowing systems to cool down. On the Starship, there's supposed to be up to 16 times as many people, and the ship will continually be in the line of sight of our sun for the entire journey. So if we multiply the amount of array panels by the 16-fold difference in crew, and double it again to account for never having a chance to cool down in a planet's shadow, that gives the Starship a radiator panel requirement of around 53,760 square feet, or about 5,000 square meters worth of these panels. That's over an acre or about half a hectare, and they're going to be heavy. But they're never shown. If they were, they'd have to look something like this. The next shot shows the infamous giant atrium windows in the nose cone of the vessel, and we have gone over several times now how such a window array would be ridiculous on so many different levels. Not only would it be incredibly heavy and terribly expensive, the thermal concerns about such windows would be overwhelming. Additionally, they would be a safety concern due to micrometeorites, which is why the two-ton cupola on the ISS, currently housing the largest window in space, has heavy-duty protective shutters to protect the four layers of glass if needed, or if the glass is broken and the hatch needs to be permanently sealed. Finally, logistically speaking, Every square meter of glass in that window is completely wasted wall space. The gradual cutaway reveals behind the atrium window is what they refer to as a viewing gallery, a donut shaped walking platform with a massive hole in the center at the bottom of about three stories worth of empty space. Again, all this wasted space serves no purpose. In our last episode, which pitted Starship against the submarine, we demonstrated how a sub needs to pack for a three month voyage Every nook and cranny has something shoved into it, and there is no chance that these wide open spaces will happen on this vessel that can fit into a nuclear sub five times over. The depiction of an astronaut moving in weightlessness across this massive room brings into question the scale being used in this segment, and the fisheye effect being used by the creator hampers efforts to measure the scale. Starship is 30 feet wide. Sounds large, but that's only five people being laid end to end across the width, and that's not accounting for insulation or the width of the hull or radiation shielding. That's outside measurements. So if we take a six foot human analog and lay them end to end, does this scale hold up? Turns out we can't see the full width of the ship at any point, so it's the best guess in this scene. It's easier in the common room where the floor covers the full width of the ship. The fisheye effect skews things a bit, but it's pretty obvious to see the people in this scene are smaller than would be required to keep this scale. The next deck down we have the gym deck, and here's where the scale really goes sideways. See the man running on the wall in the background? His head would easily be coming two meters off the wall with this running motion, and that leaves only two and a half meters to get to the center of the central access corridor. 
50 sleeping cabins means 50 people per trip, and two decks of cabins means 25 cabins per deck. We know the outside dimensions of the ship, so we can work out the dimensions per compartment. The ship has a radius to the outside of 4.5 meters. That gives the ship a circumference of 28.27 meters, and each compartment a back wall no wider than 113 centimeters. Judging from the reclined sleeping position in this scene, the compartment would be about the length of a typical mattress at 200 centimeters. Reworking the circumference for the toe of the compartment with a radius of 2.5 meters, the inner circle has a circumference of 15.71 meters. That gives this padded doorway a maximum allowance of 63 centimeters per cabin, resulting in a definite wedge-shaped room. However, this one looks quite rectangular in its floor plan. Just for reference, a typical coffin, outside measurements, are about 60 centimeters by 2 meters. So this chamber would be like a coffin, but with a little bit of elbow room. This room shows a porthole, which of course isn't possible in every room, no matter what, given the heat shield tiles on the bottom of the craft. Keep in mind, the rows upon rows of windows on every deck would eat into payload capacity and it would create additional points of failure as well, so having that many windows just doesn't seem smart. For the aesthetics of the cabin, the bamboo or wood paneling looks nice, but flammable materials are unlikely to be used aboard a spacecraft and the giant screen TVs in every room are again unnecessary extra weight on a ship that can already ill afford such amenities. We are assuming, because there is no other accounting for this in the diagram, that this is where the travelers will be positioned when the craft launches from Earth and lands on Mars. Next deck down is the combination utility room, radiation shelter, and bathroom space, and the idea that all the utilities required for this ship could be contained in these tiny, tidy, wall-mounted units, as portrayed here, shows a lack of thought put into the systems required for such a ship. Life support, air filtration, air storage, fresh water, black water, black water processors, HVAC, battery systems, electrical switching, panels, where are they all going to go? Probably the best laugh of the video was the depiction of the bathroom stalls. The depicted thrones resemble the heads on pleasure boats, when what will actually be required are proper vacuum system space lavatories that look like this, and the user must strap into them to use personal funnels. These commodes cost $23 million a piece, by the way, and having only three for this crew headed to Mars would definitely be asking for trouble. At the bottom of the elevator shaft is the airlock and second portion of the radiation shelter, and one of the things we noticed is that the crane array to get travelers from this airlock to the ground, which is a 30 meter drop, is nowhere to be seen. On the same deck is the dedicated pressurized storage, at 9 meters wide with an 8 foot ceiling accounting for a 1 meter radius access hole in the deck head for the elevator, that's a maximum of 148 cubic meters of storage. However, according to the diagram, the core of this deck is dedicated to be a muster station for radiation storms. If, as the diagram indicates, they have supplies packed 2 meters deep from the wall, they are only going to be using 107 of the available 148 cubic meters on the deck, and that doesn't even count the wall space that's used up by the airlock. Below the airlock deck is basically a throwaway deck that they label unpressurized storage read this as unheated storage because if there's no air in the compartment there's no heating that compartment much like the unpressurized areas of an airplane where stowaways often freeze to death so although the video claims batteries will be kept in this area if the area is unpressurized and unheated that's not going to happen since batteries do very poorly in the cold and they won't be storing fresh or wastewater in that area either due to freezing concerns if the plan is to keep the ship's utility on this deck, they will need to have it pressurized and heated and accessible for the purposes of maintenance, because guaranteed, something is going to break along the way. The solar storm shelter and depiction of the particle storm itself again demonstrates more thought is required. First, the couple of inches of water depicted in the walls of the craft will not stop GCRs, which will be bombarding the craft the entire journey and from all angles. They're omnidirectional, omnipresent, and they are not stopped by the massive cargo sitting beneath you, as solar radiation might be. Galactic cosmic rays tear through all manner of material as ionizing radiation. They shred your DNA, and the only way to cut that exposure in half is with a wall of water 5 meters thick. On a ship that's 9 meters wide, that's a problem. We've dedicated an entire episode to radiation shielding calculations, so if you want to, check that one out afterwards. 
but suffice it to say, when the ship is being bombarded with GCRs, those blast panels that drop across the windows are going to be absolutely 100% useless. However, in their depiction of the solar storm, let's assume the people in the shelter were kept safe. The radiation coming through the unprotected area of the hull would have wiped out every piece of electronics higher up the ship. That would have included computerized navigational equipment on the bridge, except the ship doesn't seem to have a bridge, or for that matter, it doesn't seem to have an operations deck, or a proper galley, or a medical bay, or EVA suits and storage, or really half the things that such a ship should contain. But let's tally up the decks they have. They have the unpressurized storage, the pressurized storage and airlock, the utility deck with the shelter, two decks worth of staterooms, one gym deck, one common area deck, and a viewing area that's about three stories tall. That's a total of 10 decks, but the usable space above the propellant tanks, according to the SpaceX diagrams, is only about 20 meters. So that gives each floor only about two meters or around six feet of headroom. And that's eight inches or about 20 centimeters shorter than a typical household doorway. And that doesn't include the width of the deck heads or the conduits required to plumb and electrify and heat and circulate all these different areas. So it could reasonably be only five feet or 150 centimeters from floor to ceiling in some spots, which cuts deeply into the pressurized storage deck capacity as well. It would take it to under 70 cubic meters of provisions or about 1.4 cubic meters per traveler if they had a crew of 50. And we have to wonder, would those travelers be able to cram everything they're going to need for the entire trip into 1.4 cubic meters? Wrapping it up, this video is definitely well done and very polished. It simply doesn't have enough thought put into the ship's design. To leave out major requirements such as a proper galley or eating area or medical bay, navigational bridge, operations deck, workshops, EVA suit storage, it all indicates that the producers didn't have any persons on board with logistical minds. And to waste all the space in the nose cone with giant, unprotected, and frankly useless windows, rather than cram that area full with much needed supplies, groceries, water, means that they value form over function, which is exactly ass backwards. Spaceships need to be 90% function, 10% aesthetics, not the other way around. And the total mass of everything contained in this portion of the vessel cannot weigh in excess of 100 tons. So expect the vehicle to be stripped of all the niceties that this video demonstrates. That being said, we would extend an offer to Deep Space Courier to take what they've done so far and help correct the issues we've identified to create something more practical, even if it wouldn't be nearly as pretty. Thanks for watching this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. We'll continue to wait for a Starship update from Musk that will show exactly what they have in mind, rather than relying on content providers to do the job for them. And in the meantime, we can look forward to NASA and ULA actually landing equipment on Mars when Perseverance touches down next week. We've got a couple of new Patreon patrons to shout out. Special thanks to James and Damon Trilogy for coming on board with their direct support through Patreon. And you can do so as well if you like, patreon.com backslash the common sense skeptic. Or you can support our channel by just giving this video a thumbs up, sharing it with your friends, and making sure you're subscribed so that you know when the common sense skeptic returns.